um, so when, when, when there was this call, uh, of course, the Drawing Mother Archive is an incredible uh, jewel box. Uh, you, every time you open the archive, you find something incredible. And I imagine that a lot of people would have chosen uh, incredible drawings. Uh, and I sort of went with this mission to find a banal building. Like, a, <laughs> like let's find the most attracting building ever, <laughs> which is not, obviously. But, um, and I was like, looking at factories in Chicago, and uh, I'm uh, surprised. First of all, I'm curious how Neil got this material, which is amazing. Second is the only, I feel, factory in the archive so far, like industrial, properly industrial building in the archive. Third is the, there are only two items from Chicago in the archive. One is uh, exposed outside, is a uh, Frank Lloyd Wright Midway Garden fantastic plate right outside the roof here in the building, decorating the building. And then this uh, strange uh, building built by Adler and Sullivan in 1886. So I'm going to just maybe read my notes on this and hope, I don't know. Can you pass the photos? Yes, yeah, so um, the photos I'm passing you are. Uh, this you can find at the, at the Chicago History Museum and the, at Ryerson and Barnum uh, uh, archives and the Art Institute in Chicago. And this is, uh, I mean, Sullivan and Adler, I don't know if you're aware of, but uh, the material, are, they're not, they're not, there's not much material, especially drawing about their work. And the, but thanks to, for especially uh, uh, Richard Nichol, they, we have a lot of photographs. And, and, and this is the only photograph we have of this building before being demolished. Actually, I don't know exactly when it was demolished, but for sure was demolished to be replaced by Yamasaki Tower, first an office tower, and then would become a condominium. So I think in the 1980s, but I'm not exactly sure, I haven't had the time to check this information, but this is just to get the, give a glimpse okay. of the image of the factory itself. So, so uh, the Sells and Schwab Company Shoe Factory was built between 1886 and 1887 within an industrial compound on the near, near north side of Chicago, basically right, up, right above the loop where there was an industrial compound there. Still, it's, uh, you can feel when you walk in, in that area, the industrial nature of the area. And not, from fr not far from the North River branch, uh, it's a rather conventional building, and indeed not the most remarkable among Adler's and Sullivan's works. The factory was commissioned by Maurice Seltz, which was uh, Dankmar Adler, Adler brother-in-law, so there's a certain kind of personal relationship between the client and one of the, I mean, quickly, the story of uh, Adler and Sullivan. Adler was the youngest partner of the firm. The firm was opened in 1971, right after the Chicago fire. In 1871 in Chicago is basically the beginning of everything. It's just a second boost. Uh, uh, it's an incredible acceleration. The, the city start to really grow up very quickly, and so it was very profitable for architect. And if you read, the, for example, Sullivan biographies, Arriving by train, Sullivan looking at this ruined landscape, landscape is already imagining a lot of fortune they could make <laughs> as an architect. <laughs> so, you know, just a very you know, cynical eye of the architect. That, <laughs> so, yeah, uh, so Maurice Seltz was the uh, Dagmar Adler brother in law, and then Charles Schwab would join the firm. The, the firm was the Seltz Schwab company, would be one of the most prominent uh, shoe company in the entire Midwest. Uh, they were able to accumulate an incredible fortune. Um, they, they were able to produce, at some point in their uh, apogee, 12,000 pairs of shoes per day. Uh, and they were able, of course, Chicago was also the epicenter of railway system and uh, logistical center in the, in the US. So to have a factory located in Chicago meant to be at the center of the logistical empire, let's say, at that time. Uh, anyway, what's interesting is that at that time, Adler and Sullivan were just kicking out their auditorium building. So you have to imagine this factory running in parallel to the most important, uh, if not uh, you know, monumental building in the US in the 19th century, like, late, like 1880, 60s, really the crucial moment. The auditorium building is, for many years, would be one of the biggest, if not the biggest uh, building ever built in the US at that time. But still, uh, Adler and Sullivan had other commissions for industrial uh, buildings, for example, the Brunswick uh, Ball Company in, in Chicago, the Aurora Watch Company factory very close to Chicago, the Kennedy Bakery in Chicago, the Nicely Building in Chicago. All those buildings are 1884, so just pre preceding this uh, uh, factory for two years. And what accumulates all of them is that they are all devoid of decoration and ornament with a structural layout determined basically from production necessities. So, uh, Concerning this building, they tried to obviously keep the construction cost as low as possible, 
the building was five and a half cents per cubic foot for a total of $57,700. I don't know exactly how much it would be today, but I feel it should be around $1,800,000. And it was just a rectangular volume. It was just 200 feet long per 111. So it's basically 60 per 30 meter, perfect rectangle. Uh, four story high plus the basement. And it was organized around an open courtyard uh, to ensure maximum sunlight and ventilation for the workshop. The foundations, which you could see here, and it's important to see, were on, uh, uh, sorry, the, the foundation were on isolated footings. You have to know that, of course, Chicago had a clay. Uh, Chicago is a very difficult city to build, especially skyscrapers. That's why skyscrapers in Chicago are lower than Manhattan, because the underground layer of Chicago is made of clay, and the limestone is only 100 feet below the ground. So at some point, especially Adrian and Sullivan were pioneers in building uh, buildings on piles. And so this is among the first ones to have uh, uh, separate footings. And it's a pity that we lost this section here, which have been amazing. It's the, but uh, you can see sketches of the section of the foundation here. Here you see uh, dimensional stone and the rubble stone. And the, uh, the, the, the structure is oak piers, oak post, 12 by 12 foot. You can see sketches of the section here and here and else. This is the section of the load bearing wall on the side. And this is a section of the piers, the post with the foundation. So. So it was an isolated footing, which was a common practice after this building as well in Chicago. The structure included the load-bearing uh, uh, walls, which you could see here. The, the load-bearing walls were made of brick. And uh, this was an internal structure made of oak post. So uh, the, the, the walls in the side were made of brick. And they, of course, being made of brick and four-story high, they diminish in sections. So, you can see, actually see across the plants that the, the thickness varies, if I remember correctly, from 2.2 feet at the lower level to just 17 inches at the top level, which uh, we have it here. It's very thin. And interestingly, the, the diminishing, the tapering of the piers occurs outside. So the, the most interesting thing is, thing is that the fact that Sullivan and others wanted really to show the skeleton on the outside and also save space internally. So. Internally, the, the line is always the same, but outside is decreasing. So this, uh, uh, you know, the, the, sorry, it's the opposite. Inside. The, yeah, inside. The inside is decreasing in order to uh, improve more space, and, and, um, and, and the outside is fixed. Um, so as I said, uh, the structure was a load-bearing brick walls uh, and an internal frame made of 12 by 12 oak posts. Uh, distance usually appro approximately 13 feet on it in a direction and 19 feet on the other direction. Then there is, uh, uh, so basically it's a very cheap uh, way of constructing at that time. It's still an old timber building if you want. But then there's a interesting detail. So uh, the building had cast iron joints and architects provide, uh, I think one of the most interesting plates is this, which they call the iron diagram. Uh, so here you have the section, the entire section of the building only reduced to the joints. So the, in, the, in the lower part, in the first, second, and third story, they have uh, what they call stools. And then in the upper floor, they have what they call um, uh, stirrups, or uh, let's say saddles. Um, so I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get there in a second. So the cast iron joints or stools were connecting the posts to the timber girders and joists of, of all the floors and they are detailed in this iron diagram of factory building. On the first three floors, the large I-shaped stools comprise a bottom plate, which is basically here. In the bottom plate, at uh, one inches thick at the basement and three-fourths of an inch upward. So you can see that the lower plate is different from the upper plate. And uh, of course, because of the weight, and, uh, and then there was a connecting central element, three-fourths of an inch thick. You can see all the dimension in here. Combining girders and joists to the post through tongues and bolt. Sorry for my bad sketch, but I tried to do this <laughs> this morning. So in the, basically, this, it works like this. The upper plate is a little bit like, exaggerated, but the upper plate was shorter than the lower plate. And what is interesting, and maybe a novelty, and not really common at the time, is that the joint was connecting the, both the joists and the girders on the same level. Usually in Chicago at that time, all the buildings were stuck. So all the joists were on girders. And this not only were, you know, like were created a very, you know, not very pleasant detail to be seen, 
but also you know occupied a lot yeah. of space. So in in this way, they were able to stack as many floors as possible in the in the in the amount of space that they had, and also some of the frame worked almost as a steel frame, like it was a three dimensional cage system by reducing this. It's interesting because in the expansion done by the son of Adler later on in 1903, you'll see that this would all disappear. And here you see that the girders and joists are just <laughs> elementary made. Uh, you know, like a, in a very cheap way. And you see also the bad detail that this, the Adler joint, uh, Adler son was not able to... If you, <laughs> uh, yes, in fact, we don't know in, in these drawings, you can see, yeah, there are no, there are no tongues. Uh, you know, usually you ensure the outpost through a tongue, through to a, the, basically a penetrating ed element. But what we can see, yeah, what we can see is that on the lower level, for sure, the there was a concrete layer for the floor mm -hmm. because there were machines. And so the concrete layer ensured the, you know, like, a, uh, like it stabilized the oak post in the lower level. But in the upper level, yeah, this is even more evident, but the upper level, the joint will change into a saddle or what they call a stirrup. So it's simply, it's simply lower, let's say less, uh, le much more interesting detail, but also less uh, uh, resistant element. Is obviously, there, there's less weight on the top. So the weight increase uh, over, over the floors. And so this detail will become stronger and able to support much more uh, weight. So you mean that the post is literally sitting on the plane? It's sitting on the plane. Yeah, I, I, apparently, the, I mean, this, the tongue that I'm drawing here is yeah. just a conjecture, but at, here they don't provide these details, so I don't think there is. So it's really made of gravity. It's really like a Lego assemblage. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Because it was there a concrete floor? There was a concrete floor, but there was uh, the, the, somewhere it says the thickness of it. I don't remember exactly where, but it says that, that the layer is like a few inches high. Anyway, because if this is one inch thick, three fourths of an inch thick, this should be at least uh, three four inches. Yeah. Anyway. So, so, so th this is wood, metal, and concrete. Right? Yes. So all the posts are oak, mm -hmm. and all the joists and girders pr presumably are in oak. We, we, they don't say it here, but they say here the oh. oak girder. It says here. This is another detail I'm going to explain in a second. But yeah, everything is in oak, and then the the elements are cast iron. They don't specify if it's cast iron or wrought iron, as they will do later in the extension. So this is also another detail, the refinement that will come with time. So the drawings do not show any vertical connection of the stool with the oak post, which in the upper side seem further stabilized by the concrete floor layer, as I just said. The stools were then embedded within the timber structures as joists and girders were co-planner, which allowed for minimizing floor thickness and gaining additional headroom to the working space. So despite the low-cost construction, Adler Sullivan imagine an ingenious detail that simplifies the traditional timber construction with joists above girders into three-dimensional cage system, prefiguring the future development of the timber frame to steel. A refined detail that won't be repeated in an anti-03 uh, extension. On the fourth floor and the roof, the stools were replaced by the stirrups, the cast iron stirrups or saddles, probably due to the lower weight, reinforced by cheaper timber core belts. These are the, chim the, the core belts made of wood, uh, reinforced by uh, timber core belts bolted to the girders uh, and secured by iron straps. So there was uh, this here a detail with a strap above. And in my very cheap sketch is basically th there is a strap ensuring then the saddle to the to the joist. So the elevation. Um, so no, it's this. It's, so I think the elevation is the most interesting, let's say, uh, part because uh, it's extremely austere. So the austerity of the exterior facade is devoid of any decoration and marked by the obsessive vertical repetition of the piers. The absence of any culminating cornice. So basically, you see that the building abruptly ends. You can also see in the photograph that it almost, almost the windows almost touch the ultimate, you know, the upper floor. So there is no, and, and you have to imagine that uh, Sullivan will soon theorize the famous three partition of the skyscraper. You know, you have a basement, you have a development of the body, and then you have a conclusion. So it's a very interesting antithetical, if you want. Uh, uh, <laughs> exactly. And so the only mitigation is this horizontal alternation of the white stone seals and the arch lintels, which made of brick, mm -hmm. behind the projected pier. So this uh, obsession, uh, obsessive rhythm of the piers and was alternated by those uh, lintels made of uh, arch uh, lintels. The, the exceptions in the plan are purely logistical. If you could, uh, on the basement plan, which I think is yeah, it's here. So as I said, the plan is really simple. 
So it's a rectangle with an internal uh, structural spine of columns. Of course, there are, uh, uh, um, so this is, this is not a limit, this is a vault, because uh, on the first floor, there is uh, uh, the office of the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the owner of the company. So this is for storing uh, you know, very important matters. But the, uh, um, the freight elevator is on this side, because here, as you can see, there is an exception. There is a platform made of uh, iron for loading and unloading operation, so the dock. And then this part, too, the frame change. You see that there are not the yellow oak columns. It becomes a cast iron frame with a circular eight, eight inches uh, column and a, a very slender uh, steel frame. Why that? Because in this part, there was the coal uh, loading and unloading, uh, uh, let's say, platform for the boiler, which was, uh, which was at the, in the basement. So the boiler and the engine room were connected. And so this was uh, somehow also the dirtiest part of the factory. So here you have to imagine there was a lot of uh, uh, you know, exchange. And, and so this part is very, if you want, more uh, 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 you know, precarious than the rest of the building. So these are the only. Yeah, these are the only, let's say, exception. Is this exception. a court or is that an issue? This is a court, uh, but it's very low. It's only covered the engine room. Okay. And so you cannot really access it. There is a skylight uh, roof all in glass. Skylight. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, you can see here and, and you can see it in here. Like this is already the, this is already the first floor plan. So basically it's, on, it's covering the engine room on the basement. Uh, so along the longer side and in the court, each structural bay corresponded to a double wire window. So there are all double windows on the longer side and single windows on the, on the edge. On the single windows, they are all varying in size. So whereas this is all standardized, these are all varying in size because on the, uh, on the smaller, let's say, wings, there are the restrooms, the uh, wardrobes, and the, let's say all the, if you want, the more functional utilities of the building. So they try to uh, coordinate the window size with the, with the functions. So while the uh, aesthetic and logical tripartition of the skyscraper in the Chicago Loop aim at symbolically masking the steel frame, like in the skyscraper and the pervasion of financial speculation, in the factory everything is revealed in its full violence. So everything is translated into a rational apparatus, which is a very important lesson. Uh, if you consider that a few years later, Frank Lloyd Wright, which will, which will join the firm, in, uh, if I not remember correctly, in 1888, will build another shoe company in Chicago, very unknown, the Poly EZ Polish company, uh, shoe company. And it's very similar to this one. Uh, so a very, very simple building with a very obsessive rhythm outside. And also, somebody else might be, uh, you know, like when I see Miss Van der Rohe Promontory Apartment for a sketch that does not have any basement nor any cornice on the top, Reminds a lot, also his early skyscraper for the Friedrich Strasse in 1920, you know, 2022. You know, like, this is really an attempt to demonstrate the frame, like, the, you know, like, differently from what the other architects were doing in the loop. In this part of the city, the frame is really revealed, and, you know, in all its, uh, you know, uh, uh, almost the primitive and uh, barbarian uh, qualities. So, now, so this is the building, and then what is interesting, I start to dig a little bit more, on the, on, the, on the program. So these are, these are a plate from the Sandborn maps. The Sandborn maps were insurance uh, fire uh, plants in Chicago, where the buildings are reduced to their typical plants. So you see only the mass of the building. They tell you how the building was made, what, what kind of material. And in the Sandborn map, you can find exactly the program of each floor. So the plan, they don't really say, although in some part they say vault for the office, and you know, it gives very few notes about the program. You can imagine that machine could be uh, you know, like arranged uh, erratically, but of course it was not the case. But from the Sandborn map, you can really deduce the, how the assembly operation of the shoe works. So it says that the production process seems to be vertically organized in the storage uh, sorry, the storage and cutting operations were arranged in the basement. The stocking, the packaging, and the management functions were on the first floor, which we have it here. And you can see, in fact, as I said, this is the uh, director office with the vault. These are private offices. This is the pattern room. And here you have stocking and uh, um, other, let's say, sample rooms here. This is the loading dock that I mentioned before. And here you already see the, what they call the girls and men uh, cloak rooms. And you also see that in the, in the, the wash basins are uh, internally placed for women, externally placed for men, and this will change also uh, at different floors, and I'm telling you why. Another exception is also this little garage 
uh, that is supported by a, a, a different pillars. All, this is the only weird pillar in the entire construction. It's a little bit thicker because here, of course, there is a weight of a truck. So this pillar is likely overdimensioned than the other ones. So the first floor plan could be maybe considered the creative department and the typical plan of the whole building. Sorry, I didn't finish the, se the, the sequence. So in the first floor, there was the stocking, packaging, and management. In the second floor, there were cutting and fitting. In the, in the third floor, there was sewing, finishing, and bottoming. And then in the last floor, there was the lasting operation. And I'm going to explain what they are. The, the lasting, which is basically finishing the shoe before attaching to the sole. It's basically, yeah, finishing and attaching all the pieces of the, all the, pieces of the shoe at, attached together. So basically, the, it's reverse. Like the uh, production works from the lower part to the upper part. And then where they were uh, this part, like, let's say, uh, through the freight floors, and, and the, also there are dumb waiters, uh, uh, little uh, elevators. They were just bringing back all the shoes in the lower floor. So uh, in, 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 this, in the floor, as I said, you can find the pattern room, a private office with glass partition, the director office with the safe vault, the sample room, the stock room with a dumb waiter, the freight elevator with an out outdoor platform for loading and unloading, an outdoor deck for coal with trap doors that, that are detailed in the iron uh, plan. And then the fourth staircase that allows the workers to go back and forth. So, and here is the story begins, and I think it's also the most interesting. <laughs> so at that time, shoemaking, shoemaking was a very gendered uh, production. So there was a very gendered division of labor. So women were mostly exclu exclusively dealing with fitting and sewing uh, in the third floor uh, as teachers. And whereas male workers were dealing with the cutter operation and the lasting operation. Uh, and it's interesting because you can find evidence of this gender division from a strike. Uh, there were many strikes occurring at the time. And in the Chicago Daily Trib Tribune, uh, many strikes occurred in this factory, but the, the biggest one was in 1892. At that time, there were at least 600 workers in this building. Uh, 300 men and 250 women. They all left the factory. They walked out from the factory uh, for fighting for a wage increase and because of the new and the new la lasting machines that were installed on the upper floor. The strike began two weeks before. We are talking about March 2, 1892. And uh, they were trying to protest again. I the just we were totally uh, mesmerized. Uh, I had to cut. So you've been over time. So how much time do you need? Just, uh, you to just let, let me finish with this story and, uh, and well, then cut it. Like to hear, maybe you can synopsize a little bit. Uh, simply, simply the story tells about uh, uh, the role of uh, trade unions in uh, defending the work and the fact that we lost this building and also not only physically because it was demolished, but also we lost the, uh, you know, the, the memories of the strikes is, in, is really problematic because in 1886, Chicago was really at the center of the eight, uh, you know, the f strikes and um, and the struggle for the eight hours uh, work, and you have to imagine that these were not simply something parallel to the building industry. Uh, those strikes affected the building industry heavily, and in the auditorium, for example, Adler and Sullivan had to uh, um, had to cope with the strikes of the bricklayers and the stone cutters that were assembling the uh, you know the stones and the and the timber uh, frame inside. So, in other words, they, there, was, there was a moment in which the struggle had uh, a, a huge impact over the constructions and somehow architects had to cope and also take position. And I have to say that Hadler and Sullivan were very uh, reactionary, especially Sullivan wrote very, uh, uh, you know, wrote very bitter pieces against the riots that were happening and also felt the, he, he attempted to defend the category of the architects against this uh, uh, if you want, hideous attempt to dismantle the construction, the building industry in Chicago. So I can talk later on about this, but um, yeah, anyway. You don't want to read your last paragraph? Yeah, simply, it's interesting because uh, it, uh, so this is one of the articles uh, dealing with the strike and also the important role of women. In, uh, in the strike that convinced them, them to organize into a union. And so also the building somehow trigger the, the awareness and consciousness of women workers and laborers into organizing into a union. Uh, the, build, the factory will be extended twice. First by the son of Adler in, this, uh, in a very small extension that we have here, the drawings, and then in a third one in concrete uh, uh, by, um, um, 
by Schmidt, Garden, and Martin, and the building would be uh, showcased at the Philip Johnson exhibition in 1933 at the Modern, at, at MoMA, New York, as an example of the, you know, the culmination of the Chicago School into a new thing, like using concrete. Uh, but this is an entirely new building and an entirely new story. The sad thing is that all the three buildings, so the original, the first extension, and the second extension, will be entirely torn down to leave uh, Yamasaki Tower to rise uh, in the 1980s. And today, in the 1960s, sorry, I did a mistake. It was 1960s. And today, is just the tower is just uh, towering abo above the other buildings. And the irony is that other shoe companies no next to this one are still standing and trans in trans and, um transform into very prestigious condos, whereas the one of Adler and Sullivan was born, has been, let's say, demolished. So yeah, I'll leave it there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm, I've done my job, I think. Uh, oh, so now we're discussing, right? Yes. Okay, so I yeah. have to finish my job. Okay. So, uh,